so I want to ask you to do something. I want you to lean over to the person next to you. If you're at home, uh, talk about this in the room. I need you to lean over to the person next to you, and I need you to share who you think is the greatest American singer of all time. Go ahead. Just share it real fast. We'll come back to that. We're in the middle of a series called Asking for a Friend. And what we're doing is we're addressing five of the most important questions that Christians are asking in the age of COVID. Last week we talked about why do I need the church? Today we're gonna talk about why do I need God? And to get us thinking in that direction and answer that question, I wanna read Psalm 14, which begins. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away, all have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all these evil doers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on the Lord, but there they are, overwhelmed with dread. For God is in the company of the righteous. You evil doers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. When you read that passage at face value, it's pretty clear. You've got to be pretty dumb to not believe in God. Atheists are people who become eventually immoral people. Now pause for a second. I want to go back to your question and your answer. Who's the greatest American singer of all time? If I asked you to start throwing out names, there are a lot of names. Aretha. Stevie, Sumter, Needham, Joffe, there are a lot of them, right? But it goes without saying, we all know the greatest American singer of all time is this guy right here, that guy. Not the guy looking at you, he's pretty good, he can sing, but the guy on the shirt, right? Um, in the mid 50s, Johnny Cash shot on the scene with a uh, shot on the scene with I Walk the Line, contemporary of Elvis, toured with Elvis. And during that time, he married his wife and together they had four beautiful children. And then in 1961, he earned enough money to build a beautiful house in California, and then for the next 10 years, his career shot out like a rocket. From 1961 to 1971, he became a true legend musically. Now, whenever you look at a person's life, if it's Johnny Cash or turn over and I want you to look at someone right now that's sitting next to you, I want you to stare in their eyes right now. Look deeply in their eyes. I want you to look back and say, stop it, that's weird. Stop staring at me. When you look at someone, any individual, basically you can look at their life through four different prisms, right? Uh, you can look at what people see from a distance when they see you, people that are working with you, people that are around you. They see you from a distance, but they don't really know the real you unless they get below, beneath the surface. And then there's what we see when we look at ourselves, when we look in the mirror, when we have our own self-talk. There's what people close to us see, those are in our immediate family and those close, close relationships. And then obvious, the most objective of all is what God sees. Now, why are we talking about Johnny Cash when we're talking about being aware of what's going on in our lives? Here's why. Like Every single person in this room, from 1961 to 1971, he didn't have an accurate self-impression of what was going on in his life. From 1961 to 1971, what people from a distance saw was that Johnny Cash had become one of the greatest voices of his generation. But what those closest to him saw was a drug addict who abandoned his family. 
One of my favorite books that I've read this year is an autobiography by Johnny's oldest daughter, Roseanne Cash. It's called Composed. Page 14, she wrote, 1961, my father had bought the land, cut into the side of the mountain to create a level area on which to build, have his rough castle, deposited me, my mother, and my three sisters there, and then went on the road for a decade. And she described his trips home occasionally as, during his recent visits home, he had become strange, dark, and intensely distracted. Psalm chapter 14 is a psalm about people who don't believe in God, or is it? We think we know what Psalm chapter 14 is. The fool says in their heart there is no God, they're corrupt, their deeds are vile, there is no one who does good. We read that and we're like, go get them God, go get those atheists, atheists are moral degenerates, but that's not at all what Psalm chapter 14 is saying. Let me give you a little quiz. The wisdom, the books of the Bible are in the Old Testament are broken up into three categories. There's law, there's wisdom, and there are prophets. Tell me what are the wisdom books in the Old Testament, oh ye graduates of Valley Kids? Come on. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Job. Those are the wisdom books. Everything before that is considered law, from Genesis all the way up to Job. And then everything after Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes, after that, prophets. I bring this up because Psalms appears in this collection of wisdom books. And one of the key things that we understand when we look at wisdom books is this idea of the fool and the wise person. Lean to the person next to you and tell them whether you think that they're a fool or a wise person. Go ahead and do that. That's usually good for marriages. <laughs> this idea of a fool is ubiquitous through the wisdom literature. And the idea is this. Proverbs begins how? The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of what? Wisdom, right? Um, the fool is the person that allows their beliefs to be modified and modulated by the people that are around them. The Bible talks a lot about not keeping a company of fools because every single person in this room has the ability from going, be, going from a wise person very quickly to a foolish person and doing foolish things because of the influence of other people. Now, John Golden Gay, who's one of my favorite professors, um, translates Psalm, Proverb, or, I'm sorry, Psalms 14 this way. And you tell me if there is a difference when we look at the nuance of the original Hebrew. A scoundrel or a fool says in his heart, God is not here. These people have made their doings corrupt and loathsome. What's the difference between the fool says in their heart, there is no God, and the fool says in their heart, God is not here? One is the statement of an atheist. The other one is a statement from all of us in this room. When, the, when Psalms, when someone that was a Hebrew would have been in worship, and the book of Psalms is nothing more than a collection of, how many of you grew up in churches where you had hymn books, right? Pull out your hymn book. Was it a green hymn book or a red hymn book or a blue hymn book? Where I grew up, it was a red hymn book. Then I would visit another church and they have a green hymn book and I'm like, what is this crap? What is this, right? Turn in your hymn books to what? Page 35, right? How great thou art, you know? So you're flipping through, that's what this, and that's what the book of Psalms is. It's a book of songs that are meant for corporate worship so that we can connect with God. And the psalmist in Psalm chapter 14 is not saying, People out there that are atheists, 
our moral degenerates, go ahead and turn to Psalm 15 where it will talk about us, it's not at all. What the psalmist is saying is that we have the ability in our head to say, I believe in God, I'm a Jesus follower. But in our heart, we're, we're, we act as if God is not here. That he can't, like, so if, you, like if there's a line and over here is like the Jesus-y stuff, we talk about Jesus and we'll maybe be in a small group or a study and attend church, and over here is where God isn't, the psalmist is saying, he's like, yeah, of course, there are atheists out there, but that's not really what we're concerned about today. We're concerned about the people that are in this room who in their heads say, yeah, I'm a Jesus person, but in their hearts they have a division where there's the religious kind of stuff, and then there are the places that they can go where God is not. They're functional atheists. And so the two things that I want you to notice about this psalm is first, God isn't troubled by the person, in this psalm at least, who doesn't believe in him, the atheist. God is troubled by the believer that lives like God isn't around. Everyone knows I'm a Ohio State fan because I'm a Christian. And uh, last week, our former coach, great football coach, not, I'm not a Christian, I'm not bringing this, this, this example up as someone who um, is a Christian, but he is now the coach for the Jacksonville ja Jaguars. Um, the team is getting ready to fly back after a game to Jacksonville. He says, I'm gonna stay behind. Goes to a bar and a bunch of people say, let's go in the bar and they start dancing with him. And then a girl, that was, was a girl, early, early 20s, started grinding on him. You don't wanna see me grind, right? That, that is an image that, that would be hard to get out of your mind, me, me dancing, right? But the, you get the picture, right? They're in a bar, this girl starts grinding on him, and he's not doing anything, he's just listening to the music. Someone picked up their phone and took a video of it. I bring this up is that did he not realize that there is literally a video camera in every single person's pocket and someone was surely going to do something about that. As my dad said, his problem wasn't that he got caught with a video, his problem is that he went into the bar. When, when the, the wisdom literature talks about the fool, it always talks about the fool who is a good person. And I believe that he is, he's a good coach. He's no different from any other football coach, right? Um, but it's amazing, isn't it, how good people who believe in their mind, in Jesus, can turn around and do stupid stuff when they're around other people that are willing to do stupid things. Let me talk to those of you who are in middle school and high school, and your parents are getting on you about the choices that you make with friends, and about how that person necessarily isn't the wisest person in the world, and about how they're making bad decisions and you think your parents suck and they're idiots and they don't know what they're talking about. No, they're speaking from experience. The fool says in their mind, yeah, I'm a Jesus follower, but then they're able to have a delusion going on between their head and their heart and they can get into situations where other people can shape their behavior and a good person can end up doing dumb things. If you don't believe it, just talk to the parents of middle schoolers and high schoolers and college students. We talk about kids that are in school being influenced, but it takes you about, oh, about five seconds to realize that temptation does not leave when we get to work and we're building a career and when we are living in neighborhoods and we have friendships and we can get togethers. That the temptation for people who say in their head, I'm a Jesus follower, to not listen to their heart, and they end up doing dumb things. We think nobody's paying attention. Over here, 
That's where church is on Sunday. But on Friday night, Saturday night, and during the week, just going out, it's just a drink with friends after work. What could possibly go wrong over here besides God isn't paying attention over here? But yet verse two says, the Lord looks down from heaven over in this area on all mankind. Here's the second thing I want you to notice about Psalm 14, is that one of the countless reasons we need God, and this is what we're talking about today, why do we need God, is because he's the only one to provide the knowledge we need to live life well. Um, for those of you who are new, uh, um, I um, bugged my wife for five years to get a golden retriever. And so I did what any good moral person would do. I went to her Instagram account and I followed every single golden retriever Instagram account on Instagram. Started out with, why are all these Instagram account people showing up in my feed to, oh, isn't this cute? To her sharing videos, to her saying, we ought to get a golden retriever. And I'm like, are you sure? She said, yes, we did it. So we got a golden retriever. So um, we were getting family, uh, some family photos done and uh, our favorite photographer in this area, Chelsea Martin came over and snapped a picture of Meadow. So she's a golden retriever, she's a red golden. Um, and this is a breed that has been bred over the last 300 years to retrieve waterfowl. She's a hunting dog. And um, recently, the, one of the reasons we wanted to get this is because we moved out to a couple acres of land way out in the sticks, and it was just trashed. And so we cleaned it up. Do you have this video? Well, why don't you just show the video here? So this is uh, uh, the video of her running around in the yard. We, we cleared all the junk and the trash and everything. And, showing off. and she just loves running around there. And uh, one of the things that we did is, um, I planted, um, as we're cleaning up this property, I planted 40 arborvitae trees. And I got a bunch of them from Arbor Day. Have you ever ordered plants from Arbor Day? Um, Arbor Day, you can order them and then they send them to you and you go and you plant them. And so uh, Meadow um, is out there while we're uh, planting these trees. And I wanna show you something. Um, so we planted these, arbor, these arborvitae trees, and the person that helped me plant them said, you better protect those arborvitaes, or in the winter, the deer are gonna come and strip them clean. I'm like, okay, I didn't know that. He said, they make these menthol sticks, these sticks that smell like a Irish spring soap, and the deer will come, and you just put these pegs right behind the arborvitaes, and it will keep the deer from stripping your, your, your trees clean. And I'm like, okay. I'll get some of those. And then I looked on uh, Amazon and different places, realized they're pretty expensive, and you know me, I'm cheap. So I realized all you had to do was get a steak, buy some mesh bags from Amazon, and go to the dollar store and put some Irish spring soap in these things, right? It looks, this is the, like, the most jacked up thing you'd see, but I did it. It was cheap, right? So I went behind all these arborvitaes and I, I took my sledgehammer and I put it in the ground. And the very next day, Meadow brings one in her mouth and sets it at my feet. I'm like, why are you doing that? The next day, what do you think she did? Another one, another one. 40 days later, all of these things are gone. They're in a pile right by our garage and I'm yelling at this dog, why are you doing this? Why is she doing that? Because she's a retriever. It's in her DNA. Lean to the person next to you right now and share fundamentally what are we over thousands of years of practice as human beings, what have we been bred to do? Lean over to the person next to you, share that. We know from experience and we know from scripture that inherent to our makeup as human beings, verse three says, all have turned away, all have become, in, in Hebrew it says, loathsome. There is no one who do, does good, not even one. 
that our natural tendency, if we leave our hearts to themselves without any influence or mentorship or wisdom from the outside, our natural tendency is to stray and hurt people. Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. But when we, ha we have God's word, that can be this modulating force that can constantly help us, help us turn it into a daily check where it's bringing us back on course and back on course and back on course. But what, what we're fighting against, this natural DNA and who we, who have we have become as human beings is, Verse four says, do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. Lean to the person next to you at home and here and tell them how many times did you put food or drink into your mouth yesterday? Quick, what's the number? Do that. Anybody wanna share? I counted yesterday six times. Nothing but lean meat vegetables, fruit, no pizza during the football game. What do we put in our mouth? Maybe, maybe five times, six times, or maybe seven times, depending on the, you know, the size of the meals and that sort of thing. What the person in the psalmist is saying is that our natural bent, who we are, if you leave us alone, we will hurt ourselves and other people the same number of times that we eat every single day five times, six times, seven times a day, you leave the human heart alone. It is bread to hurt other people in itself. So we're asking the question, why do I need God? And we have fantastic group leaders here at our church who give of themselves and their time to walk by people and they, they practice the ministry of just simply being present in someone's lives and helping them to become attuned to what God is doing and getting them to feast and nourish their soul as a daily mo modulation to, to their heart. We love these people. And, and so we asked group leaders, what, why do people need God? And here are some of the things they said. He's the only constant in this unstable world. He helps us get through life. Life doesn't make any sense because of its unpredictability. God is the higher power that we can rest in for wisdom, for salvation. That's an obvious one. Why do we need Jesus? Because he died on the cross for our sins so that we can have our sins forgiven and have the hope of eternal life. But there's more for hope. We can't do it alone to be a constant. And then it says to be set on the right path. I wonder how many people right now have like an accurate understanding of your life. My goodness, if you have all the money in the world and over a 10 year period of time, Johnny can turn around and just leave four girls, having an affair, be unfaithful, get hooked on drugs. Just imagine what we could do without God. There's a psalm that I want us to walk through right now that says exactly what we're talking about here. If you want to live a life the way you were designed to live it, you have to listen to the knowledge of the designer, of the person that designed you. And so this is why at the beginning of the psalm, psalm number one, is the preface for all of the Psalms that are to follow, including Psalm 14, and it says this, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. These people are no different than anyone else. The only difference is, is that these people are refusing to be in the company of fools and instead are investing themselves 
in the word of God and constantly allowing it to modulate their life and constantly course correct and bringing them back and bringing them back, bringing them back. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of a company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water. And I can't wait, hopefully, to take you, some of you to the Holy Land so you can see the desert and then see springs of water that are coming up. And you're like, oh, I get it. How incredibly rare and beautiful is it when you see that? This person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prospers. Why? Because they're not listening to fools, they're listening to God, and God is leading them to be prosperous in what they do. Not so the wicked. What's the difference between, we just talked about it, what's the difference between the wicked and the righteous? Nothing. They both believe in God in their head, but the wicked refuse to act like it in their heart. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Let's pray. Lord, we need you because without you, all we do is hurt one another and ourselves. Let the knowledge of how we are supposed to live seep constantly into our minds and hearts. Let us, let us be changed and renewed constantly by the renewing of our minds and our hearts so that we naturally become like you because we are in the company of the righteous who are holding us accountable and encouraging us to move on. We thank you that we are a part of a community faith where we just don't have to be perfect. We don't have to wear masks. We don't have to make excuses. We can just be. know, God, that you're there with us. You're guiding us, forgiving and helping along the way. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.